Welcome to UCF in Print. I'm Alice Collier. NASA's multi-billion dollar budget request to the U.S. Senate subcommittee has prompted more complaints in recent years. Critics of the agency argue that the drive to go back to the moon is now coming at the expense of scientific endeavors and aeronautics research. In the meantime, the human spaceflight program continues to struggle for its existence. In his book entitled Reinventing NASA, Human Spaceflight, Bureaucracy and Politics, UCF political science professor Roger Hanberg talks about the dramatic changes that could be in store. Welcome, Roger. Welcome. Well, NASA certainly has had its share of bad luck in recent years, hasn't it? Well, it's had bad luck, it's, but a lot of the bad luck was foreseen if you read the internal reports that have been done on NASA. Challenger was probably the most egregious example of a failure because the O-ring problem that they ended up destroying the uh, shuttle during its liftoff was something that was talked about. It became, uh, well, what happened was NASA engaged what, you, what we call the normalization of risk. We ac they accepted a higher and higher level of risk each time each flight because nothing happened. And finally they went over the barrier and, and, and collapsed. The question of the Columbia loss is another kind of uh, repeat of the Challenger question. They normalized the risk. They, foam was falling off, ice was falling mm -hmm. off. They had seen this repeatedly, but nothing had happened. So what happened was you become complacent. That's a human tendency. And it's one of the problems you have when you have an organization that deals with very risky or dangerous kind of activities. You, you get used to it. You know, we talk about that and you see that in other areas like people who put out oil fires. Mm -hmm. They get overconfident, then they, they make mm -hmm. a mistake one day, they're barbecue. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, go back to Challenger. Um, and you talk about that being a dramatic change uh, within NASA. Where were you when the disaster? Where was I? I was uh, associate dean of uh, graduate studies and I walked outside to watch the flight and I watched it go up and then suddenly I saw these things going in different directions. The two solid boosters were breaking up and I knew it was coming back in and when I walked back into the office someone had a TV on where they talked about the downlink was lost which meant they had no communication. Uh, by that time the uh, shuttle um, uh, cabin had struck the ground, struck the ocean actually. Uh, and that, that's one of the great kind of mysteries that it will not be revealed to the public is how long were the crew alive when the shuttle uh, cabin were they alive during the descent? Mm. And the argument is basically most of them were. Apparently, a couple of them they had their oxygen cut off. Uh, apparently, or they didn't get it turned on. Uh, whatever happened. So, what a, the re, there is a report out that talks about you know some of the physical stuff. There's no uh, release of the recordings that were made because they have an internal recording system so you can get at least the voices of the crew. The, the argument is that that's not, that's voyeurism watching oh, people. Oh, I see. Last agony, this mm -hmm. is not real TV. This mm -hmm. is real life and you don't want to do that to people who are dead. So there, there could have been a moment where they realized Well, there was more than a moment. Apparently there really? was the, the, the fall took longer than that and there was pr pretty clear evidence, I think, indirect because NASA hasn't directly said it that yes, they were alive and they did know what was happening. Bigger question in Columbia, the same thing. How fast, mm -hmm. how long did they know? Well, we know that the Columbia, for example, the computer system kept trying to compensate for the wing coming apart and uh, the crew must have noticed or known there was something going on, but we have no video of that. The only video that was recovered uh, was cut off before that, p that point of the uh, flight, although they got pretty close to. So we don't know, uh, you know how long they knew they were gonna die because there was no, neither situation, there was no possibility of rescue or, you know, abandoning. We don't have any way to abandon the shuttle. Horrific situations. I think we all remember where we were when we, each of those mm -hmm. um, took place. I remember as a, uh, as a young reporter covering that up in Michigan and just really, um, uh, you know, it going out and getting interviews from people, people were shocked. Do you find that the morale changed in America uh, about the space program, that people were less inclined to be as supportive as they had been in the past? No, not according to the public opinion polls. Public opinion polls always find the American people supporting the space program. The, uh, the problem NASA always has, especially with human spaceflight, is the public supports it, but if they're asked to compare, spending money on the space program are comparing uh, spending money on something else, Medicare. they always choose uh -huh. the other thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, since the Apollo program, uh, NASA's been in 
what we would what people call the uh, Apollo complex, which is this view that what they need to do is get a spectacular thing like Apollo, and the public will join into the idea. The politicians will buy into it, and they can go forward. The problem is Apollo was unique historically, because Apollo grew out of the Cold War, which meant that things were justified on the basis of national security, national prestige, et cetera. That doesn't happen anymore. So what happens, NASA is continually struggling to get the public and the political leadership to accept uh, their view of what's next, which is more human spaceflight. Uh, the Bush administration has apparently started that idea, but Again. Because the Bush administration has been supportive of, of human spaceflight. You know, for for those um, uh, people who may not, you know, be be as knowledgeable about NASA. And I know you're not a historian, a political scientist, but if you could just give us just a brief history, and so we can we can look at these changes. When the space program started in 1957, it started with the Soviet launch of Sputnik. The United States had. Uh, to respond as quickly as possible. We were in entering the space race, although we didn't quite know what it meant uh, at that particular point. Uh, our first uh, rocket, uh, the Vanguard, flew two inches and then crashed on the landing pad. I remember as a child in Oklahoma, you go out and you could watch Sputnik go across the sky, what you thought was Sputnik, because planes didn't fly that high. Mm -hmm. And we assumed that's what I saw, you know, but uh, so there was a lot of excitement. And then to watch the American version blow up basically. Uh, the satellite survived and was put in a cabinet somewhere afterwards. <laughs> it was a little bitty thing. Uh, and so what happened was the United States had a lot of pride and a lot of national prestige involved. That meant we were willing to spend what, it, what was necessary to catch up with the Soviets. The Soviets beat us to space with a human first. Uh, we followed, but the difference was the Soviets went around the world. <laughs> Ours was an up and down flight. Uh, Alan Shepard you know, flew down to the Bahamas, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we were now in space, it was quite different. So what Kennedy did in 62 was to change, we were losing all the first. Mm -hmm. So what he did was in 62 was to, uh, 61, excuse me, May 61, was to change the conversation and say, we're not gonna worry about who goes to orbit, how many people go. We're gonna say, we're gonna go to the moon within the decade, land a human on the moon and bring him back. And that was an enormous uh, effort. NASA, which was created in 1958, uh, was built on this idea that this was their mission. It consumed everything. All the space science, early space science, probably 80% of it was oriented to find out more about the moon. For example, we didn't, you know, we didn't think there was green cheese there, mm -hmm, right. but we didn't know how deep the dust was. So we were afraid we would land a shuttle and it would come down and sink out of sight. Right through the universe. You know, you know, we, you know the capsule would disappear, you know, <laughs> yeah. because we didn't, we weren't aware of what was there. So what happened was that when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, uh, the Eagle landed you know, on July of 1969, the space program was basically over as far as the politicians were concerned. And what has happened Over since meaning what? We've the, done the, it, we, that's we've, it. We've done it, and in fact, what, was, what happened was we flew more missions, but we canceled the last missions, the ones that really were gonna do science. Uh, those were canceled because there was no point to them as far as the politicians were concerned. So what NASA started in 1967 really, basically even before Apollo landed, because they knew that once we landed on the moon we had to know what's, what's next. What NASA spent from 1969 until the flight of the uh, shuttle in 1981 is basically trying to recapture that spirit, that energy that was in the Apollo program. And NASA proposed the shuttle, it was a, but originally they proposed a shuttle, a space station around Earth, a space station around the moon, uh, bases on the moon, and then ultimately we were go, supposed to go to um, Mars by the 1980s. Uh, all of this was part there, and so what happened was in 19, 72, the only thing they got was the shuttle. Mm -hmm. But the shuttle was never built to be a spacecraft for exploration. It was supposed to be the vehicle that was used to carry the pieces of the space station to orbit, carry supplies to orbit so that we could then jump off. Uh, the uh, space station, is, as has been called by Roger Lanius, who's a former historian at NASA, it's called the base camp to the stars. We have this base camp and we're gonna now move out. 
The problem is the space station, which was approved in 1984, has taken over two decades and it's not mm -hmm. done yet. And so what happened was the politicians are gradually became disinterested. The, the political momentum's gone. We don't care if the Russians go to space. We don't really care if the Chinese go to space, although some people like to use the Chinese as a way to rebuild this, that momentum, like political momentum, by creating a space race. Well, that's not there. Mm -hmm. the, po the population's not interested. American government isn't interested once you get away from the space people. The military space people worry, but they're a different set of questions. And so what happened was the space station dragged along. In 1993, it came within one vote of being terminated on the House of the uh, Representatives floor. My, there was a vote. Close. Uh, it, there was no political support. So NASA, the, but the book basically says, NASA ignored all that. NASA kept focused on its mission, which is human spaceflight. It does other things, space science, it does commercial development, it does aeronautics. But each time there's a conflict between putting money into human spaceflight into the, all these other areas, the other areas always lose. And you see that playing out right now. Right. And what happened was basically by 2001. Well, they're taken from Peter and given to right. Paul, kind of. What happened in, in 2001, the Bush administration comes into office and there is no political support in the administration for a space program. Uh, the first decisions made by Bush are to cut things. He cut the space station from seven crew to three, which has now been reversed. We're supposed to build it so we can carry seven or six or seven uh, people mm -hmm. on, the, on the station. All that was done because the administration didn't see it as a priority. Ironically, the loss of Columbia forced President Bush and his administration to think about what do we do and what they came up with their vision for space exploration, which now talks about going back to the moon and going uh, to uh, Mars eventually. The problem from NASA's perspective is they finally got a president to back them, but the president who's backing them is putting no money into it. He's increasing the budget by $5 billion over five years. In the American Not enough? In the American government system, we got a $1.8 trillion budget. Mm -hmm. That's chump change. Mm -hmm. And so what they're doing is they're having to shut down the shuttle, cut off our work on the International Space Station, uh, to save money to put into the Space Exploration Initiative. Space science, they're talking about cutting back on programs, they're turning off satellites next year is what they're proposing. For example, we have the Voyager missions that are leaving the uh, solar system. They've been running for 25 years, they're still good for another maybe 10. Uh, the answer is we can't afford $5 million to keep gathering the information from them. I mean, that's ludicrous if you think about it in that sense. But it's part of the goal of NASA to build it. But here's NASA's problem. Hmm. NASA's problem is they can build the um, technology, the uh, crew exploration vehicle, et cetera, and all that. But their program is going to be a 20-year program, or maybe even 30-year program to get to Mars. That means it, President Bush will be long out of office when decisions have to be made in the future to pay money. See, what made Apollo possible was you only had two administrations. One was Kennedy, and he was basically- very supportive. Uh, not really. In mm -hmm. 1962, uh, excuse me, 63, he went to the UN and proposed having an international mission uh, to the moon with the Soviets. He was willing to basically drop our program and make it a joint program. But then he was assassinated, so what happened was that proposal went nowhere, the Soviets weren't interested. Well, why don't we do that now? We are, but we, no one wants to go as much as we do, we think, or as much as NASA wants to. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that there's, a political, that there's a political support in Congress for it, and that's NASA's problem. If you're talking about a 20, 20 or 30 year program, you're gonna have multiple presidents, probably four or five presidents, probably what? 15 Congresses are all going to have to sign on the dotted line and pay for it. We've never had a program go like that, that long, where each year we have to decide to pay for it. And that's NASA's problem. It goes all the way back to Apollo. Since that time, there's never been enough political support to guarantee it. Social Security we, you know, is now a subject right. of debate, but Social Security is easy because no one has to appropriate money for it. 
It's paid for out of the money mm -hmm. that's gotten uh, through the payroll taxes. So it's not like Congress has to sit down and say, uh, we're going to have to write a check for $1 trillion for Social Security. They're not having to do that. They may have but to do it in But every year, future. NASA has to go back and ask this. Well, that's right. And it's increased, though, every year. Not really. Well, this past year, it's what uh, they're asking for, like, 2.5% 2, 2 more. If you look at the projections NASA had in 1991 and 1992, they were like this. There's like a f they were supposed to be over $20 billion now. That was a projection just to do what they were doing. NASA's not guaranteed to get the money that the president requested. Presidents request all they want. Congress is the one that decides. That's the American mm -hmm. system. That's why presidents are, in some cases, are, their powers artificially inflated because they appear very impressive. I Here is my budget, here is my address, <laughs> look at this. Yeah. But the problem is Congre Congress comes six months later and says, <laughs> right. we don't want to do that. Right. We prefer to do this, and, th and that money goes away. And the other problem NASA has is there, some congressmen say, oh, let's give them the money, but I want to designate that money for my special project in my district, pork pork barrel. Uh, NASA is supporting a um, astronomy program for a state school uh, in Kentucky. Hmm. Does NASA want to support it? No. NASA's not asked. The chairman of the appropriations committee says, I want that money. They will give it to them. Uh, all that money gets sent, that's money off the top. And then everything else goes. This uh, sounds like politics. It is politics. I mean, one of the things I always, I teach this course in space policy, one of the things I find always amusing is when the engineers say, oh, that's politics. I said, you better get used to it. You're in a field where many of the decisions are going to be political decisions, not technical. You hope that the right technical answer occurs. And that's been NASA's problem. And then NASA compounds the problem by the fact that it has had major failures. Most of the time, Congress doesn't pay much attention to, Congress, to NASA except when it fails or when it has a success, but successes mm -hmm. are short term. Failures live on. You know, there's congressmen after Challenger, after Columbia, after the Apollo 1 pad fire, you know, who mm -hmm. lost any faith in the, in the agency. Now, the agency got better in Columbia than it did in Challenger. When, by the time Challenger investigations and everything was done, NASA had zero credibility because the feeling was in Congress that you know, how do you know NASA's lying? Their lips are moving. I mean, it sounds cruel to say it, but NASA had lied about the cost on the shuttle. They c could never get a straight answer how much the shuttle cost. And so, but what I argue in the book is, the reason why NASA did it wasn't because they were trying to cheat. They weren't taking the money home. Nobody was m getting, you know, bigger cars or nicer homes. What they, they, they were so driven by their mission, by their idea that, human spaceflight is so important that they were willing to spend all that political capital. Well, so why is it so important to them? It's, there is a group of people in society, and I put them, myself among them, who feel that space is for a lot of reasons that are not necessarily economic, not necessarily something you can put your hand on, but for, you, you know, you talk about, they talk about the human spirit, the frontier, looking at what's over the next hill. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of mystiques about that. Exploration. It's yeah. the exploration concept. Mm -hmm. And it can get very mystic mm -hmm. and mystical in a, lot of, in a lot of case. But the point is that there are people in the agency who are bureaucrats but are driven by that vision. And if you stay at NASA long enough, if you're in the areas of human spaceflight, you buy into it. That become, you know, because it is dramatic, it is wonderful, it is different. Uh, but the problem is that's not shared. Other people say, oh, yeah, the, you know, I saw the Apollo landing. You know, was there, I was, you know, watching TV when, mm -hmm. you know, they put his foot down and mangled his quote, you know, as to who, what he was. You know, the point is the politicians as a whole say, now, we've done that. Why do we need to go? Because we're, it's not like we're talking about we're going to get rich going to Mars. What's in Mars? We're looking for prehistoric microbes. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if, if I'm sitting here and I'm a congressman and I'm saying $16.5 billion, you know, why do I have to spend it for something well, like that? And especially we have a war going on. 
Well, that's right. The war is par war is part of it, but the war is you know a separate kind of item. The, the, that NASA isn't generally linked to the war because there's a lot but of other. But there's money. So when you when America looks at you know here we should give you know NASA all these billions of dollars and there's a war and a deficit and. Well, but the deficit other. doesn't seem to bother anyone in the administration, so I don't know that the <laughs> deficit's really a way to talk about it. No, the, the deficit has made NASA possible back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the deficits allowed NASA to have how'd aspiration. How did it make it possible? Because you were willing to spend the money. If you really had to have a balanced budget, which happened in the mid-90s, mid-late 90s, mid -90s NASA's budget slowed down and went down, actually. So you talk about the budget growing. That's relative to projections and relative to you know what happened. In the 90s, the budget went down because we were doing balanced budgets. And so what it meant was every dollar from NASA meant you took a dollar from somebody else because mm -hmm. it was only so many dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, deficit spending in the 70s and the 80s and now in the you know 2000s allows NASA to, to grow. Uh, if, if we had to have a cut back to a balanced budget, NASA's in the group of things that are called discretionary spending, which means it's nice to have, but you can live without it. And so those are the ones that would be cut. So what do you see for NASA now? It's got a new director. The new director is giving, is, has a honeymoon. I mean, he's doing very well in terms of the initial politics. He's willing to reconsider the Hubble thing because that's been kind of the, you know, the um, test case for does NASA really care about space science uh, in any case. Uh, the previous uh, director, Sean O'Keefe, was an accountant and that's what he was sent for. He was sent to be a bean counter. And he ironically became more of a NASA person by the time he left. You know, he started talking mm -hmm. about things and all that. And he's the one that was in the inside getting this vision for space exploration put in place. But the problem is that his bean counting meant that he found he could use the safety argument to do away with the, the Hubble. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, the argument. Now Griffin, Griffith hasn't said it's gonna happen. He just says, well, we're going to think about it again. And we're going to think about it in terms of technological issues. Safety is going to be the prime concern. If there is another shuttle accident, the shuttle program is dead. It will not fly again. In fact, there was some concern after the Columbia whether it would fly again, because supposedly all those safety procedures after Challenger were in place. Mm -hmm. But none of them seemed to work. Because from the outside, and you saw some of the commission members who did the inv Columbia Investigation Board say, it looks like the same old pattern. You fly for a while and you get complacent, you get comfortable. And so something that's fairly trivial, you know, so a something like this hits a shuttle and now the shuttle is incinerated and destroyed, you lose seven crew members, you know, how can we trust you in the future? And they overcame that because the argument was fixes can be made, but when the shuttle flies in July instead of May, which is part of the safety thing, it was delayed because of the ice problem, what you're going to see is that um, the NASA will be flying without being able to do all the safety things it said. It won't be able to oh. fix fix the hole in the wing if it has one. Um, it, it that's doesn't not good. Happen. No, it's not that's, good. That's it's not, not, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. They don't have the, it, it's, it is truly, as people like to say, you know, what well, they usually say negative, oh, this isn't space science. Well, this is. This is hard engineering science. You got to be able to work with materials in a vacuum, it's incredible cold. How do you do it? You know, how do you make it go in there? It's not like putting putty on your car where you can smooth it out and look at it and then paint it up. You know, you, you just want something that'll work to, while you return. You teach college juniors and seniors this space flight po policy. Space, right. What do some of your students take away from your class? Well, I, different things. I think the engineers are shocked to know how much what a lot of them want to do and love to think about doing uh, aerospace engineering is so dependent on politics. But that's a reality. A lot of them are going to go off and work in uh, you know, various uh, launcher programs, missile programs. All of those up to this point are, have gotten major funding from the government. Uh, the government. So government decisions will impact them. There's others who I think are shocked at not politics so much because they're political science majors, mm -hmm. uh, but what they're shocked at is 
how the decisions are often made on very short-term kinds of agendas. You know, uh, a president cuts the budget of NASA this year because he wants to look good doing something, or you know, uh, something is added to the budget, uh, and the budget continually changes. NASA has gone through major changes over the last decade. We almost lost the space station. Now we're building the space station. That's our priority. The priority was we're not going to go do anything except circle the Earth with a shuttle and the space station. Now we're talking about space exploration. What happens if the next president comes in and says, I don't think we can do space exploration. It costs too much. And so we cut back. Sounds you, like another book, Roger. No, no, <laughs> that, that's a book in the future, and that's, that's, that's going to be more difficult. Uh, because I, I don't think anyone really knows. Because one of the questions is, can we b finally build a space station? You know, I want to ask you, because we're almost out of time, about your next book. You have one coming out very soon. Tell me briefly a synopsis about that. Uh, it's a book on international space commerce. Basically, what it's looking at is the changing pattern of how money is made in space, basically. Uh, in the early days, the United States was dominated this, the situation because we were the only ones that had rockets that went to orbit. What, so what, is, what the book is, the book traces out, uh, is the decline of the United States, not as the United States getting weaker, but its power relative to other states in space commerce has declined because other states now do it, like the Europeans have built the Aryan rockets, mm -hmm. and uh, the Chinese now have their Long March rockets, and the Ch Japanese have their H2s, all that. What you're getting is competition. And what we're seeing is how that competition plays out in an international legal regime that doesn't provide for that. Uh, the, no one can send a rocket to orbit or a satellite to orbit without permission of a state. That's built into the rules. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. Uh, there's a, a complex set of rules that determine whether sat where satellites go and how they work and all that. And so what I'm doing is looking at the kind of the rise of compet co competitors to the United States and how that's changing the future of uh, space commerce. Uh, because a lot of people think there's a lot of money to be made there. There is, but it's very difficult. It requires technologies that are still very fragile. It requires mm -hmm. other things uh, be put in place, political arrangements, so that you put a com communication satellite in orbit, you actually have somewhere to send the messages. Otherwise, it doesn't do you any good. Let me ask you, will you come back and talk with us again when the book is out? Sure. You are a man after my own heart. I was a political science major. I could sit here and listen to you. I, I need to audit your class or something. <laughs> Thanks, Roger, so much for joining us at, today. Again, the book is Reinventing NASA Human Spaceflight, Bureaucracy and Politics. That's our program for now. Thanks for watching UCF in print. I'm Alice Collier. Until next time, goodbye.